Hello, welcome to another STAT 432 video. Uh, this will be a very brief introduction to mostly the idea of generative models. And to talk about generative models, we sort of first need to talk about a discriminative model. And I need to move myself. I might uh, eventually just get rid of myself, but for now I'll put myself up here. Um, so discriminative models are a model that will directly model the conditional probability that we're interested in, right? So, so this is pretty much everything that we've done so far, um, but we just haven't uh, called it this because we have no other thing, right? So um, KNN, I think it's pretty clear that like we're just saying, well, we're directly modeling this, we're looking at the nearest neighbor, so that X point uh, and so on. Uh, trees do that, but in a slightly different way. And with logistic, this is very clear, right? We're just directly modeling the probability that Y is one given some values of X. Um, and this statement that I have at the bottom here is sort of how I, I start to think about this when we move on to what a generative model is. But so with the model that we've obtained in a discriminative model, we could not generate new data. We could, if you say, if I give you an X value, because then if I give you the X value, you know the distribution of Y, you could generate a new Y. But if I just said to you, hey, I want a whole new row of data, including the Y and the X's, the feature variables, with these models, you just couldn't do it. So enter generative models and uh, so what they're gonna do is they're gonna model the joint distribution of Y and X. And so by doing so, um, uh, given this model, you could generate new data. generative models. Okay, cool. Um, so that's the big difference. Uh, here, we're going to model the full, full joint distribution. Previously, we were just directly going after the, after the conditional that we need to make classifications. Okay, cool. So, well, how do we then take this joint distribution and make classifications? Well, it turns out that we still want that conditional distribution uh, in order to make the classification. So, sorry, I just need to rearrange my desk a little bit here. Um, so what I mean by that is what we're going to do here is we're going to uh, divide by probability x equals x. And that's a little notationally sloppy, but we're going to allow it. All right, so just applying the definition of conditional probability, we can get to the quantity that we need, right? So once we're here, we know what to do. Um, so the question is, how do we get there? And, and the first question is how to model this. So uh, uh, I'm just gonna get rid of my face by uh, da, 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 like that. Okay. Um, one reasonable question to have right here is, well, well, wait, why, why even bother going through this additional step? Um, and that's a good question to ask. And I'm not going to go into the details of that. Um, with the uh, notes, I, I added uh, a reading from, um, I believe it was Ng and Jordan um, uh, that discusses exactly this. And so show some of the possible performance benefits by doing this. Uh, but like most things, you're going to have to validate and figure out if it's actually working well. We're just introducing the idea here. Okay, so I want to sort of look at a picture that maybe tells a bit of the story here. So what I have here is a two class classification problem. Uh, and and I'm going to I'm going to refer to this idea of data blobs. Um, so I have the blue blob and the, the pinkish blob, right? And so what this is, it's a, it's a, it's a graphical representation of um, 
uh, classification type data where we have a, a categorical response here. I'm using one for blue and zero for pink, uh, and then feature variables x1 and x2. And so um, something we could do is assume that, okay, conditioned on y equals one, so we're only talking about the blue points, we're gonna assume that x1 comma x2 follows a multivariate normal distribution. Um, we're not gonna go into the uh, details of multivariate normal. Hopefully you've seen that somewhere else. If not, maybe I'll post some readings on that. But ultimately, multivariate normal has two parameters, uh, the mean and the variance. Uh, but the way I would suggest you sort of think about those, the mean is the location. So it, it's it's the center of the blob, but it dictates where the blob is in this, in this case, two-dimensional space. And then the variance is going to be the shape. So the variance controls uh, the, the sort of uh, shape of the blob, sort of around the location of the blob. I know blob is a very non-technical term, but it's very useful. Okay, cool. And then we can do the same thing conditioned on uh, y equals zero, that is the pink points. So we can say, well, oh, these also follow multivariate normal, uh, but with a different location parameter and a different uh, uh, shape parameter. Uh, in, in this case, uh, sigma one and sigma two are two by two matrices that include the variance of x1, the variance of x2, and then the covariance uh, on the off diagonals. But again, we're not going to go into that detail necessarily, although we will talk about just one little aspect of it later. So notationally, I'm going to say that uh, the PDF of x1 comma x2 given y equals one, uh, I'm going to label that f sub one of x and similarly for given y equals zero i'm going to label that pdf as f sub zero of x okay i'm also going to define two more quantities so if we ignore x1 and x2 and we just wanted to talk about things like the probability that y equals one uh, i'm going to label that quantity pi sub one and if we want to talk about the probability that y equals zero, I'm gonna call that quantity pi sub zero. I realize now that these twos make no sense, those should be zeros to keep my notation consistent. Okay, cool, sorry about that. All right, so that's great, but what does that do for us? So thinking about the quantity that we're interested uh, in this case, Let's just focus on the probability that y equals one given x equals x. Well, then we simply apply Bayes' theorem. And that gets us uh, an expression that is a function of the, the two pi's that we just defined and the two PDF's that we just defined. Um, we're playing a little bit fast and loose with what is a probability, but, but this is a legitimate uh, definition. So, um, to, to sort of rename some things here. So pi sub zero and pi sub one, we would call these prior probabilities, except I can't spell prior, uh, prior like that. Um, we would call f sub one of x and f sub two of x, the likelihoods. Likelihoods. Um, and then this, probability here, this conditional that we care about, we would call that a posterior probability. Uh, if you know anything about Bayesian statistics, this will sort of sound very familiar. So before looking at the X values, you have some belief about the probability that Y is one and zero, then you observe some data uh, and you can sort of uh, calculate a likelihood then. Um, and then you tie that all together through a Bayes theorem and you get an updated belief about the probability that y is equal to one. But so if we're keeping track, um, we need to estimate a bunch of things. So we need to estimate. So clearly pi zero and pi one, um, that's sort of obvious. And how to do that is pretty simple. Just look at the proportion of zeros for pi zero, look at the proportion of ones for pi ones, or 
you as a practitioner could just say, here's my prior belief and specify those two things. Um, we'll see how to do that in the notes about how to do this in R. Um, we need to specify, we need to learn mu1 and mu2, that is the location. Uh, not two, it's zero. I'm messing up my notation, sorry. Uh, mu0 and mu1. In this case, these are both two-dimensional uh, vectors. Uh, and then we also need to learn the shape, sigma 0 and sigma 1. Uh, and then you might be like, well, how do I estimate these things? We already talked about pi 0 and pi 1. Uh, for the rest, how about an MLE? We won't go through the details of that, but if you're bored, maybe think about that. Uh, I also posted a reading um, from Introduction to Statistical Learning that also goes through the nitty-gritty details, but I want to stick towards the general idea. Okay, so in general, uh, we might have more than uh, two categories, zero and one. We might have um, potential categories, uh, one through capital G. Um, and in that case, um, this is just a general expression. But notice that um, this quantity here, which we have the prior times the likelihood, keeps popping up. Uh, and taken together, that can sort of be, you know, the joint distribution that we ultimately wanted to model. Uh, and note that this F sub K here is going to be assumed to be conditioned on Y equals K and is assumed to be multivariate normal with location parameter mu sub K and shape parameter uh, sigma sub K. Okay, so now we want to think about... Um, you know, learning this F sub K here, and in particular using multivariate normal to do it. But we're gonna talk about three different ways to do that. And the way that these will be different is that we're going to put different restrictions on what that shape matrix, that shape parameter, the, the, the variance matrix here, will look like um, for the three different methods. So the first method is called LDA. The L here stands for linear. Uh, the D, I almost don't even want to say this because it's super confusing. The D stands for discriminant. It's linear discriminant analysis. Um, that discriminant is different than the discriminant method we talked about earlier. Here is referring to the fact that you can get a discriminant function, which helps you determine the decision boundary, but we're not even going to talk about that. Um, but the linear comes from the fact that uh, when we look at these three blobs, if we sort of think about the resultant decision boundaries, when we learn it, it's going to look something like this, and they're linear. Uh, but we're not going to get into the details of that. The important thing here is that linear discriminant analysis assumes that the, the blob for each category, um, they all have the same shape. So sigma 1, sigma 2, each group um, they all, we're just going to assume that that matrix is the same for all of them. Therefore, we're assuming that the shape is the same everywhere. So it's kind of a restrictive model. So QDA uh, stands for quadratic discriminant analysis. And it does not make any assumptions like this. It says for each category, you can have a different shape. Um, so we're, we're assuming a completely different multivariate normal uh, for the feature variables within any category. And so this is, you know, one picture that would satisfy that. So we see wildly different shapes, um, maybe not too wildly, but three different shapes within the three different categories that I've drawn here. Okay. So the last one is the one we're going to focus on the most. It's called naive Bayes. So naive Bayes... Uh, makes a pretty specific assumption. So it allows for a different shape within each category, but there's a restriction on those shapes. In particular, all the off diagonal elements are gonna be zero. And if you know anything about multivariate normal, what that implies is that condition on any individual class, the feature variables are independent. So notice that these blobs um, there's no correlation within them. So they're, they're uh, circular uh, or, or at least not you know, diagonally slanted. So there's no correlation here. Um, so that's the assumption that naive Bayes makes. Um, so it's, it's somewhere between 
LDA and QDA in terms of like restrictiveness of model, it's actually sort of hard to compare, but it's a, it's a very specific set of assumptions. And I should say that it's a set of assumptions that's almost never valid in practice, but it still turns out to be very useful in practice. So why is that? So what I, what I just said on the previous slide is that naive Bayes says that, okay, given Y, the X one through X P's, that is the features are independent. So it turns out then instead of a multivariate normal, uh, what we have here is just, it breaks that, that multivariate normal breaks down into the product of a bunch of univariate normals. So what this F sub K J is, it's the PDF of feature J uh, given Y equals K, right? Um, and so in particular, we're assuming that that PDF follows a normal distribution with mean mu sub K uh, and standard deviation um, sorry, KJ and Sigma KJ. But now these are no longer vectors and matrices. These are both just scalars. Uh, and these are what we need to estimate. But that's a faster estimation. That's an easier estimation. And it's all in all far fewer parameters. Because if you could just compare naive Bayes to QDA in the same setup, um, QDA has to estimate all of the, the covariances, whereas naive Bayes just assumes they're zero and moves on. So it turns out that while the naive Bayes assumption is almost never satisfied, uh, it works very well in practice, especially if you have a pretty large um, number of features. Okay. Um, okay, so that's great, but how do we do this? Well, long story short, we're not gonna go into the details, so we're just gonna let R sort of do it for us. So each of the three methods we just said can be done in R. Um, the LDA function uh, we will use from the mass package. The QDA function also comes from the mass package. Um, naive Bayes, there are many, many, many uh, different packages that implement this. We're in particular gonna use this KLA capital R, I don't know, I don't know how to say it, CLAR package um, to pull out the naive Bayes function. Um, and I think you'll find, um, that these functions are not too difficult to use for you based on everything you already know. Um, I can bring my face back here because we're about to wrap up. Um, so I, I haven't said a lot of the details here. I just wanted to get the big idea across to you. But I think what you'll find is that when you start using these functions, you'll be like, oh, oh, here's those probabilities that I wanted to get, kind of like all the other methods. And you'll feel right at home using them. And just like everything else, like these are more things in our toolkit now uh, that we can consider using, but we still have to validate that it's working well on our data uh, and then perhaps decide to go forward with that model. Okay, um, much shorter video than um, the associated uh, long-winded video I did this week about R, uh, but still, if you made it to the end, good job, and I'll see you in the next one.